I think most of us are familiar with the fact that uh, children have a pattern of development that, uh, that you can see. You, can, you watch them as they, as they grow up. And if you've raised children yourself, or perhaps if you're a school teacher, you've probably noticed that children grow from one stage to another, you know, in a fairly normal pattern until they reach uh, maturity. Now, some would say that you, you never stop growing, but I think most would agree that the formative and early years in a person's life are the times when the changes are most critical and most noticeable. Now, our studies in human development have helped us to describe certain key stages in a child's growth and provide assistance for those who are either slow in their progress or stimulate others who seem to be progressing at a faster rate. So, you know, we know the development of children so we can help the slow ones move along and kind of encourage the fast ones to uh, reach their potential. We know that uh, in our society, in our studies. Now, I'm saying all of this because I'd like to make a comparison in my lesson today. It's been my experience as both a father of four children and a minister of a congregation in various situations of hundreds of families that the interest and the anxiety experienced by parents over the proper development of their children is the same as the interest and the anxiety felt by ministers and elders as they observe the proper growth and development of each church member. See what I'm saying? Just like parents worry over, are my children growing up at the proper rate? Preachers and elders also worry, are our members growing up at the proper rate as well? The same anxiety that is, that is felt. Of course, I'm not a child psychologist or other type of expert to be able to give a competent lesson on the particular stages, you know, in, in, in the development of a young boy or a girl, but I am qualified to talk about normal spiritual growth. I've worried about that for a long, long time. And so this morning I'd like to share with you what the Bible describes as the normal pattern of growth for a healthy, for a healthy Christian. Now I know that when it comes to children, no, til no two children are alike. We certainly have experienced that in our family. Four children, all very different, very different characters. Each child is unique, each with special gifts and abilities, as well as weaknesses and challenges which need to be addressed and overcome. You know, every child is different. Your challenge is different with each one of your children. Well, it's the same with Christians. No two are the same. <clears throat> Some grow up in Christian families, for example. Others become Christians when they're adults. Each person has emotional and social and spiritual baggage that they bring into the life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. No two Christians are the same. However, just as in the development of a child where there comes a time when each has to attain a certain level of intellectual and social skills, Regardless of, their, regardless of their background, at a certain point they need to be able to write their letters and another, they ought to be able to control themselves, go to the bathroom, and hopefully go into the bathroom before they learn how to write, but anyways, you know what I'm saying. You know, even though kids are different, you want them to hit certain marker points you know, at, a certain, at a certain point in time. There also comes a time in every Christian's life, regardless of their history, where certain abilities and levels of maturity need to be acquired if a proper rate of growth and spiritual health is to be maintained. Same thing in the Christian life. There's this kind of, everybody has to hit a certain marker point at a certain level in order to have this normal Christian development. Now with children, we tend to rate their growth curve in years. You know, at a certain year, they know how to read and write by this age, certain social skills by another age, the ability to handle advanced material and ideas at yet another age. With Christians, on the other hand, because they are converted at different ages, the growth curve is measured less by years 
and more by character. In other words, we can tell if a person is experiencing a normal pattern of spiritual growth if the following elements begin to appear in their character. That's the setup, that's the point. And so in the following order, some of the character things that have to appear to demonstrate normal Christian spiritual development. Character trait number one, obedience. Obedience, first thing, obedience. In Matthew chapter 28, after Jesus has given the apostles you know, the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then he says what? Teaching them to observe or obey all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Notice, part of the Great Commission, not only to go out and preach, but to teach not just the words of Christ, don't just teach them the material, don't just give them the doctrines, teach them how to obey the things, all the things that I have taught. And so in his instruction to the apostles about the task of spreading the gospel and making disciples, the very first thing he instructs them to teach was obedience. No further growth in Christ is possible without obedience. None, zero. It begins with the first step of obedience as we take when we obey the gospel. Repentance and baptism. These are the first true acts of obedience in Christ. For many, they think it's their last. <laughs> wow, I finally come to the end of the road. I've obeyed the gospel. You don't realize that's the beginning of the road. That's the beginning of obedience. That's the beginning of getting it. That's when you're finally beginning to get it. Oh, you want me to obey. Oh, oh you want me to repent. Oh, I see. Oh, you want me to be baptized. You want me to do that. Oh, I get it. You know, some people might think that faith is the first stage of Christian growth, and in a way it is. But faith is stillborn without obedience because without obedience, faith has not been fully realized. We know the passage. James tells us, show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. I will show you my faith by my works, by my obedience. Obedience is the visible sign that your faith is legitimate. Obedience is the visible sign that your faith is sincere. Obedience is the legitimate sign that your faith is operational, that your love is sincere, obedience. We can always tell by obedience who has reached and mastered the very first level of Christian growth. Because there's obedience to the Lord in matters of personal conduct. There's obedience to the word in our response to the world when under pressure to conform to the world. There's obedience to the things of God. Obedience in matters of faithful worship. Obedience in Bible study, in fellowship. You know, one of the reasons we're so careful to track regular attendance to Bible study and worship in this congregation, one of the reasons we do that because neglect in this area is a sure sign of spiritual weakness and immaturity and risk of falling away. It's very simple. You cannot be a mature Christian and not come to church. <laughs> you, can't, you, you, know. you cannot be a great ball player unless you get your at bat on a regular basis. And the guys in the Hall of Fame are not the guys who were on the bench. They were the guys who were in the play day in and day out and day in and day out. I mean, after all, if a person can barely manage to handle the simple thing, going to church, 
which is part of the elementary level of Christianity, how will he or she handle the more difficult and challenging things to come? How do you hang on to your marriage if one of your children dies? Where do you get the faith to keep going in a moment like that if you haven't even cultivated the faith to come to church on a regular basis? Where do you reach down? Where is your well? And so the first stage of Christian growth is obedience. And not just obeying the Lord, but truly desiring to do His will in every situation. You know you've mastered that step when it's important to you to know and do what He's asking you to do. You know that you've arrived and you've surpassed this first level when knowing and doing the will of the Lord is a priority in your life. Next stage, if you've got that one down, Next stage is service. Not a complicated lesson. Stage one, obedience. Stage two, service. In Ephesians chapter four, beginning in verse 14, Paul says, as a result, we are no longer to be children. Notice he's talking about levels of maturity here to members of the church. We're no longer to be children, children in the faith babies in the faith. And listen, if you're not a child, this is what happens to you. He says, as a result, we're no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, there's the service, according to the proper working, there's the service, of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. We begin by discipling ourselves to obey the Lord and His word in order to allow the spirit to rule over the flesh. That's what he's talking about, being tossed about. So I've heard some say he's only talking about doctrine here. Well, yes, he is, being talked about, he is talking about being knocked about by every wind of doctrine coming along, but he's also talking about emotion and temptation and changes and wishy-washiness. And you know, we're knocked about, we're never steady in one place. That's what he's talking about. And he said, children are like that. They mature in the faith, they're like that. They're knocked all over the place. Monday they're over here, Tuesday they're over there, Wednesday they're going to go into the ministry, Thursday they've gone back to the world. You know, it's like they're nowhere. So obedience, that first step, requires us to be firmly rooted. We're not knocked around like kids. And soon we realize that this is only a preparation for the next stage of development, which is service to the Lord and His kingdom. Learning and practicing obedience is like spiritual boot camp. Eventually we are trained enough and knowledgeable enough to join the battle for the souls of this world. Eventually we realize that we've been saved to serve, not just saved in order to improve our morals or character. Some people think the only reason that we got saved was to quit smoking. Or to quit swearing. Or to quit running around on our partner. We think that was the reason God saved us, really? Paul summarizes the process in 2 Timothy, part of that passage was read. I'll just complete the reading. He says, and from childhood you have known the sacred writings which were able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God, notice he doesn't say the child of God, he says, the man of God may be adequate, filled up, and equipped for what? For living a good life? 
for overcoming his bad habits? No, he says, equipped for every good work. Service. Service. Note the development pattern for Timothy. He learns the word that brings him to obedience and salvation. And through the word he is trained to know and prove what is good and what is true and what is godly. And finally he is trained for good works, service. This is the point where Christians begin to get their eyes off of themselves and they begin to see and feel a responsibility for the needs of other people. Other people in and out of the church. And it usually starts with small things. Actually, that card from Sue, all the things she mentioned were small things, weren't they? A visit, a card, a phone call, a well wish, a casserole dish. You know, they're just small things, but look, look how much they meant to that, to that family. Acts of service that can be done. Now usually we begin by acts of service that can be done conveniently. Passing out the plates, passing out the bulletins, turning on the lights. Those are acts of service, but they can be done while we're here. Eventually, however, service grows to a point where the person is seeking the Lord in prayer for their own particular ministry, a way that they can use their own skills in the service of the Lord. With time, a Christian grows into a leadership position teaching others how to serve. One thing that is noticeable, however, once a Christian is busy serving and cultivating others in service, obedience becomes much less of an issue. That's just the way it works. I'm just telling you the mechanics. That's how A is connected to B and B is connected to C. Of course, there are always challenges to overcome and tests to our faithfulness, but once you have reached a maturity level where serving is your focus, these challenges become much fewer and much easier to handle. And so stage one, obedience. Stage two, service. Characteristic number three, love. Love. You see, once you've committed to obedience and involved in service, your character will begin to change because of the various challenges that you will face. Obeying Jesus changes you. Serving others changes you. In the end, God is recreating you in the image of His Son and the issue of His character, which is, which is love. Jesus established this ultimate spiritual goal by His own example and teaching. He said, greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. Jesus taught this principle and he lived this principle. He also passed it along to his disciples as the objective to try for in their spiritual lives. What did he say? This is how all men will know that you are my disciples in the way that you memorize scripture? This is how all men will know that you're my disciples because you've got the right answer to everything? This is how all men will know that you are my disciples because you are a good person? No, he said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John 13, 35. In the mature Christian, we can actually see obedience born out of love for God, not just fear or guilt, but a submission of will based on genuine love for the Lord and His word. We can see effective and dynamic service based on a sincere love of the church, love of the lost, love of giving oneself to God. You know what? Love the church. I think the easiest thing to criticize is the church. It's the easiest thing to criticize. Well, you put 400 sinners together, are you kidding me? It's like a pinata, you, know, you can't miss with your criticism. Close your eyes, make a criticism. You're going to hit somebody. The challenge is to love the church. Love her. Christ loved her. 
What makes us think that we can denigrate her, criticize her, talk badly about her? Finally, in the mature man and woman of God, we can see Christ in their words, their reactions, their approach to things, their willingness to seek after the good of others and not just their own self-interest. John said that those who do not love do not know God, for God is love. 1 John 4, 8. In the end, it can be said of the nature of the mature Christian, the one who has grown up fully in Christ, that he or she truly knows God because they have mastered the art of Christian love. What is the thing that we appreciate the most about our elders? Isn't it the fact that they can still demonstrate their love to us in so many ways? Isn't it the fact that we can observe them as they grow in their capacity to love? Isn't that it? Shouldn't that be it? As I close this morning's lesson, I encourage each one here to measure themselves and honestly determine where they are in the process of Christian growth. Now I preach this lesson because I believe that a lot of us don't understand the dynamics of growth. In order to have proper spiritual development, we need to know the stages so that we can measure where we're at. We also have to consciously be moving from one stage to the other. Imagine how boring and confining it would be to remain in kindergarten class until you're 18 years old. You guys, you youth guys, how would you like to be in kindergarten now and learn the same stuff? You know, put the little, somebody said yes, well, all right. <laughs> you know, Put the little blocks over here. Now, okay, I color this circle red. Now everybody color this circle yellow. You know, imagine you're 18, you're 20 years old, you're sitting in the little chairs. You know, so that's ridiculous, isn't it? There are some people who've been Christians five years, 10 years, 50, 30 years. They're still in kindergarten. They're still dealing with obedience. Still dealing with obedience. No wonder church gets boring. No wonder the world and sin looks so appealing. We've been stuck at the elementary stage of Christianity for so long that we've become bored with it. We're tired of doing it. But if on the other hand, we just learn to obey the Lord, become focused on being faithful to worship without being wishy-washy and undermined, if we learned our spiritual ABCs that the elders and ministers and teachers are trying to teach us, we could be trusted to move on to the next and much more satisfying level, which is service. And once we learn to serve, once we learn to minister, we will finally begin to experience the great rewards that come from cultivating a loving and Christ-like character that Christian service and only Christian service can shape in us. Only one way to shape it and that's through serving. I repeat again, measure yourselves, take stock, look in the mirror of the word and see where you're at. If it's time for you to obey the Lord, then you know, do it, do it. Repent, be baptized. Or if it's time for you to be restored or simply making up your mind once and for all that you'll try each day to obey Christ, then do it. And if on the other hand, you've gotten the hang of this Christianity thing and you've been training long enough, then find some way to serve. Volunteer, sign up, keep your eyes open for an opportunity, pray for it. Believe me, believe me, the Lord always answers always answers the prayer, dear Lord, show me what I can do to serve you. That is one prayer I guarantee you, he will answer. Sometimes you have to push your way in and, and create a space for yourself. You know, we mentioned Nita Whitman this morning. You know, Nita Whitman was a kind of a shy person. She kind of held back, you know, she wasn't kind of all over the place, but that, 
sister, that dear sister, she made her way, she fought her way in, she found out what was going on, she volunteered, she got involved. She served and she got the benefits that came from that, from that service. You know, there's much to do here and we have so many who have been watching the work for a long time. Maybe it's time to get into the game because that's where the reward is. That's where the love is formed, getting into the game. You know, I come from Canada. <clears throat> it's amazing that you know, two people who've come from Canada and lived there for many, many years have to go to Florida to get pneumonia, but anyways. We come from Canada and Canada is a hockey crazy country. And in Canada, uh, and of course there are teams in the NHL, <clears throat> uh, in the NHL they play for what's called the Stanley Cup. It's the championship trophy. Stanley Cup, I believe the oldest trophy in, uh, in organized sports, donated by Lord Stanley to the, uh, to the hockey clubs back in the eight, late 18th century, something like that. Interesting, the Stanley Cup is just a bowl. It was just a bowl with silver bowl. That's all it was at the beginning. And now it's a silver bowl that stands about this high and it's got rings that go all the way down. And each ring, each ring is, is the engraving of every player's name on the championship team for every year. So if you won the Stanley Cup in 1910, your name, if you were a left winger, or if you were a goalie, or a trainer, if you were the coach, your name is engraved on that line. If you were a hockey player back in the 1950s, and now you're old and you know, way beyond playing sports, you can go to the Stanley Cup and just go down to the year and put your finger on your name. And you can say, I, I was on the championship team because your name is immortalized on that cup. Well, Christianity is like the Stanley Cup. Only the players on the ice, they're the ones that get paid. Only the players get their name on the trophy. If you're in the stands, all you get is the opportunity to watch and make comments, but your name will never be on the cup, will never be in the book of life. Obedience, service, love. These are the stages. These are the objectives we need to strive for to complete our Christian growth. And make no mistake, each one of us must develop along these lines. No one is exempt. There is no other way. And so I encourage each of us here today not to leave without first deciding where they are spiritually and then making a firm commitment to move towards the next stage, whatever stage that may be. And if we can help you in your decision to obey Christ in repentance and baptism, to obey Christ in prayer and restoration, if we can help you in finding a place to serve or welcome you into our Christian family by placing membership, or if we can help you become a more loving and patient person, whatever it is, whatever way that we can minister to you our elders and our ministers are here this day ready. The church is here ready to pray for you at this time. Please come as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.